It's an early morning start for those of you in Australia and for many of you also a, um, a holiday. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to join with us. I'll just give a few moments for um, people to finish joining us. Okay, so we're a few minutes past the hour and we'd like to try and keep this webinar um, nicely contained to the hour. So I'd like to start by welcoming you all and also to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land from which I'm broadcasting to you today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to their elders and their families and I extend that respect to the traditional owners of the lands from which you all meet with us today. My name is Christine Wells and I'd like to welcome you all to this information session which has been put together by um, the Human Cell Atlas Equity Group and um, the Australian Oz Single Cell Network. There is a widening health equity gap here in Australia as in other parts of the world and I think it's important to acknowledge that medical research that does not partner with Indigenous communities and here in Australia particularly with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, risks further widening that equity gap. Particularly as we move into a diagnostic era that relies on genomic testing to direct therapies for childhood diseases or for cancers, the quality of the reference materials that we use is fundamental to the quality of the diagnostic information available to us. And if we fail to account for the rich diversity of Australia's First Nations peoples, and we're failing to, uh, to account, uh, to be accountable to the Australian people in general. I think the Human Cell Atlas adds an important context to these references because it provides a map of the genes that are active in the different cells across our bodies. And importantly, it's this activity that helps us, helps us understand how genes contribute to the function of tissues uh, in health and in disease. Over the past 12 months, we've seen the power of this type of reference in action. We've seen the identification of cells which are impacted by mutations in cystic fibrosis, for example. And we've also discovered which cells are targeted by viruses like the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's impacted us all so globally in the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm particularly encouraged by the approach of the Human Cell Atlas because I think it's a unique grassroots consortium. It's crowd-driven science on a scale I have never seen before. And inclusion in the Human Cell Atlas is not about stamp collecting and it's not about sample quote, quotas at all. It's about building partnerships, capabilities and long-term engagement. And it's about putting community and community benefit firmly first. So, Today's webinar has been jointly organised by the Oz Single Cell and the Human Cell Atlas uh, communities. You've got representatives from those communities um, on the panel, and I want to give you plenty of time to ask questions of those panellists. Today, we're joined by uh, Norbert Tavares and Joan Cool from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Alex Shalek, Kathleen Tibbetts, and Tim Tickles from the Human Cell Atlas. Charlene Naik from uh, Oz Single Cells and the Human Cell Atlas. And uh, Azir Hermes, who's the Deputy Director of the National Centre for Indigenous Genomics. I'm very grateful uh, that Azir agreed to join us today. I've asked her to provide us with a brief perspective about just what partnership with the Australian community means. So Azir, I'm going to mute myself and hand the microphone over to you. Thanks, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, yes, my name is Azure Hermes. Uh, I have two roles here at uh, NSIG. One is the Deputy Director for the National Centre, uh, but I'm also the Community Engagement Coordinator, which I've been for the last uh, almost six years uh, since working at the university. 
Uh, firstly, I'm a Gimloy Wallabai Yidinji woman from Cairns, far north Queensland. My family are the traditional owners of the Cairns region, um, forcibly removed to the community of Yarraba when Cairns was, be Cairns was being established back in the 1800s. So I have very strong connections um, to North Queensland, Cairns region. Um, I too would like to acknowledge, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land we're meeting on today. Um, I'm currently sitting on the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people lands and I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of their traditional, their elders, they're both past, present and emerging. Um, I'm very thankful to be allowed to, to live on their country and to be able to do the work that I do on their lands. So thanks so much. Uh, Christine, thank you again for organising this. Um, this is you know, this is something that's really important and something that's quite close to my heart, community engagement. Um, for those who don't know, NSEEK has a historical collection of samples. We have 7,000 from 35 different communities across Australia, and most of those samples were collected in the 60s and the 70s. Consent probably wasn't given at the time, given the environment um, of the 60s and 70s. Most Aboriginal people were living under the Act at that time. Over the last six years of working with NSIG, the one thing that has become very apparent to me is that um, having proper community consultation and having proper informed consent goes a long way in this business. Genomics has had a really terrible reputation. Research in communities has had such a terrible reputation in communities. And it's taken a very long time for me to be able to build trust within these communities um, to have them agree to be a part of the repository that we're trying to create. When we talk about community engagement, it's not a matter of going in for two weeks and providing a gift card for people's services and then disappearing with their blood samples or their tissues or whatever it is that we're collecting. It can be up to 12 months of continuous engagement, going back to communities, having consultation, talking, um, all those sorts of things before you even think about having consent or taking consent. For this particular forum today, I would really like to make sure that Indigenous people are properly represented, that if we're going to, to do this, if this is going to be something that we're going to you talk to communities about, it has to be Indigenous led. We have got some incredible Indigenous researchers right now in Australia that are doing great work in the genomic space. Um, and if this is the area that we move into, then they are the ones that have to lead this. That cannot be done by anybody else. Um, and the reason being is that we run a risk of this being done incorrectly. We put us back another 10, 20 years when it comes to genomics. The other thing that I'd, I'd probably like to, to point out is that this costs money. It's not a cheap process to go and do this type of community engagement. Um, and so if, if we're committed to working with Indigenous communities and we're committed to the community engagement side of this, it has to be funded correctly and it has to be funded properly. The last thing I probably would like to, to point out is that in terms of infrastructure um, and data sources here in Australia, currently we don't have the infrastructure to be able to support something like this. Um, and it's not just about, we want something that's safe and secure. We wanna make sure our data is, is safe. Um, we don't want it to be just accessible to any every man and his dog. Um, so I think in terms of where you start first is really building that infrastructure up and making sure we've got the correct data services in place in order to hold this data and to protect it. Um, so they're just, I um, know we're on a very short time, Christine, and I don't wanna take up too much time, but I would just say that if this is going to be done and it's going to be done properly, then that community, that Aboriginal led project has to be, there's no negotiating on that. And the second thing is really investing in that community engagement properly funded. Thank you so much for that perspective as you I, um, completely agree with everything you said there and um, very strong commitment from the old single cell community to support indigenous led projects. Um, in this and um, other initiatives. And one of the reasons that I have asked um, Shalim Naik from the oh, Single Cell and Human Cell Atlas um, group to, to come to this panel is to provide some insight during the question and answer time about what capabilities we have here in Australia and how we might support Indigenous-led proposals.
I'd next like to invite Alex and Kathleen to give us a little bit of a perspective about the Human Cell Atlas activity itself and what the goals of the Human Cell Atlas, particularly in regards to this call, might be. Alex, are you able to share your slides? I am. Thanks so much for the invitation, Christine. And, uh, I completely agree with everything that Zora just said. Um, and hopefully um, some of what uh, was brought up will be reflected in some of the slides that I'll uh, present today. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. So I will briefly touch on the Human Cell Atlas and I'll, I'll speak specifically about some of the efforts that have been made with respect to um, equity within the Human Cell Atlas. And I'm speaking on behalf of myself, um, Musa Mashlanga and uh, Partha, um, who are the co-leads of the HCA Equity Working Group. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I wanted to sort of give you a sense of what the HCA is trying to do overall and how we've tried to engage communities um, in the building of the Human Cell Atlas. So I think the first place to begin is, is to say what a Human Cell Atlas is. And really what the goal of the Human Cell Atlas is, is to build a periodic table of the cells of our body to really uh, chart our basic building blocks. The idea is that we want a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells as a basis for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating health and disease. Um, there are a wide variety of different uses of such a reference ranging from understanding basic mechanisms of disease to the toxicities associated with specific drugs to better diagnostics. Um, and there's a white paper that the Human Cell Atlas wrote that I would refer you to that's up on the website. And I'm happy to talk about any of the specific applications um, of the HCA, for example, in COVID during the Q&A part. Um, the HCA you know, involves charting this incredible reference, which means looking across multiple different systems of the body, uh, thinking about multiple different tissues that span, um, you know, all axes of variability that are relevant to human health. Um, it brings together advanced experimental and computational methods, and it requires a lot of organization because of how broad it is. Um, it is a relatively new organization. It really, you know, got kicked off with an early launch in October 2016. Um, and there have been a number of efforts since then that have involved meetings among investigators all around the world, creation of local um, you know, committees and uh, communities, really with the effort of getting uh, you know, global engagement in this entire process. And I think that one of the things we're trying to do specifically within the HCA is to really actively engage the global scientific community and the individuals um, who are donating examples in the process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, although it is young, um, you know, there is a large number of uh, funders who have supported many projects in the space and are committed. And I'm really speaking on behalf of HCA Equity and our efforts there. And then um, Jonah and Norbert will talk a little bit more about the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative um, that um, has recently been announced and what they're hoping to do there. So just to give you a sense of what has been done so far, um, we've been creating atlases of multiple different tissues um, across this large global scientific community. Um, for different organs, there have been a number of different samples that are run, looking at you know the tens to hundreds of thousands to even millions of cells within specific tissues. And this has given us these incredibly complicated views of what makes up these uh, different organs, where now I'm showing you some plots for every single point as a cell and the groupings tell you about something that's happening within the individual cell types and some of their markers. I'm happy to dive into the science, but given the time, I really want to just talk about the engagement in the process. Um, you know, from the get-go, there's always been this view that the HCA is anchored on egalitarian and comprehensive principles. And really, we've always felt that it should be compositionally inclusive, that it should represent all of humanity, you know, spanning genders, ages, ethnicities, traditions, cultures, and um, disease susceptibilities, that really it shouldn't only be in the people that, um, you know, in the samples that are represented, but also in the people that are performing the work. So it should span countries, level of education and training, and really try and, um, you know, deal with some of the regional barriers to success. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here to chat today. Um, and that we wanted to touch all sectors of society to really educate and engage people in this process and to bring as many minds as we could to this effort. Um, because, you know, diversity of background and 
from vantage point very often leads to innovation, which is critical in this uh, sort of work. So it's a relatively young organization, but it involves investigators from all around the world, uh, from 76 different countries and multiple different institutes. And you know, many people that are not listed on this website are formally engaged as well. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing is we've been trying to increase representation um, in countries that um, you know, don't necessarily have as many individuals as we would hope uh, actively participating in the generation of this data. So to try and increase equity in the HCA, um, we've held a series of meetings that would help us to better understand um, what we should do and how we might, we might actually go about it. There was an initial strategy meeting that a number of us participated in um, with support uh, from the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation in, um, in London in 2019 that really helped us think about some of our strategic goals and develop an initial action plan. And then we had a follow-up more comprehensive meeting on the shoulder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Grand Challenges uh, event in Addis Ababa, where we really came away with um, some things that we were going to actually try and do. And to give you a sense of how we've come to define equity in all of this, really what we mean when we think about equity in the HCA is we mean you know, inclusive representation, participation, and benefit from data, very much to the point that Azur brought up before. Um, and Christine as well. We want to make sure that we are creating a reference that is useful to all of humanity and doesn't actually disproportionately um, benefit one group at the expense of others, as unfortunately has happened too many times in the past. We want to make sure that we are forging scientific um, partnerships and creating capacity and leadership um, with partners around the world. We want to make sure that really there's attention paid to you know data benefit. And that it's not just something that is helping uh, one group as opposed to, you know, at the expense of another. And so, you know, this is a very brief description that we've sort of used, but more holistically, there are a number of principles that are behind this, including the concepts of power, empowerment, you know, open participation, shared sovereignty, engagement, um, shared ownership, things that really come to some of the points that were brought up before. And, you know, I really like the idea of mutual accountability and reciprocity. Um, and you know, many of you would have suggestions and I would encourage you to pass them along. You know, I'm very new uh, to this sort of work. It's very important to me and I would take any suggestions um, that any of you might have on what we should do. But really what the equity working group has realized is that some of the most important things that we can do are focus on empowerment, education, training, and outreach. Um, you know, because if we want people to get involved, we need to do something about that. And so, um, if we want to be equitable, we need to get people involved in the process and help engage them in it. And so this is something that we've been actively doing, um, not only through bringing together partners in some of these initial meetings, but actually traveling um, in a time pre-COVID um, to actually go and have conversations with uh, scientists all around the world to tell them about what's actually happening in the HCA, help train them in methods and get them involved so that they can actually do their own research using some of these approaches and contribute to the HCA as equal partners. And um, I can tell you that I would love to be in Australia right now um, instead of in Boston. Um, and I look forward to a time when I can visit again. Um, just some initial success stories. Um, you know, we have an equity working group that sits around and thinks about a lot of these things. Um, we're always open to having conversations with additional people. Uh, many of the people um, on the panel today are actively involved in this. It's diverse, but it's a small panel. Um, so we welcome additional input, voices, and opinions. Um, and, you know, we're really working to try and build some local networks to help catalyze future efforts. We spent a lot of time building new communities and networks, for example, in Latin America, where we've gone from very limited representation to having, you know, entire HCA meetings hosted locally getting engagement across multiple different countries in the region and figuring out what are areas where the human cell atlas might be transformative uh, for local science um, and you know helping to stir up local funding interests to get people involved. We've done things that are a little less advanced in other regions of the world such as in um, India and um, you know parts of the uh, uh, Middle East um, and they're actively working with parts of um, Asia that you know haven't actively been involved to the degree that we would hope. Um, you know, a lot of this in the past has involved actually going places, sitting down, and listening to concerns, trying to train people, um, trying to understand how we can um, enable them to participate. Um, we had done this in Brazil, 
we have roadshows and engagement activities that we'd like to do in the future. Um, hopefully, as soon as COVID restrictions are lifted. Um, and, you know, in the meantime, we're spending a lot of time exploring how we could get virtual training is going uh, to enable people to participate sooner um, and to start to build bridges and nuclear uh, networks. Um, and we're trying to create more materials that are up online so that people that just have a passing interest that want to see what's going on can go start to engage with those materials and use them um, as they move forward. Um, and, you know, we've been using COVID-19 as a way to sort of link all of us together. It's, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, something that has kept us apart, but it's also a great unifier in the sense that it has impacted all of us and it creates a shared experience and something where we can show how this is beneficial. Um, you know, we've learned a lot along the way. I'll say that I've learned a lot and we've tried to distill down some of the principles that we think are most important. Um, and it, and many of the things that were previously brought up are reflected in um, some of the learnings we've had that really are about, you know, listening, um, supporting the community, uh, giving trust early and trying to earn it, and uh, things of the like. So, you know, really what we're thinking of at the current moment are, you know, how different ways that we can be equitable. Um, and really getting back to some of the points that were brought up, our initial goals really focus on trying to empower regional partners so that they can establish local priorities, performance goals, collect data, control that data, um, and actually contribute in ways where they're comfortable and where the consents are actually, um, you know, appropriate. Um, you know, it's obviously an incredibly complicated organization because it spans across so many different countries and uh, groups. And that's why we need to really partner with local um, individuals, not only in the sciences, but also in law, government, and social sciences to make sure that we're doing something that, um, you know, is in accordance with um, local guidelines and also, um, you know, takes into account local needs. And, you know, also, to get people to be interested in this and to want to be part of the success, we're really trying to develop better comprehensive educational programs that could help people engage in this process. Um, some of the things that we've been trying to do that are a little bit harder in this age is to do some of these roadshows and trainings, as I mentioned in the past, um, to try and figure out how we could do bi-directional travel opportunities to enable people in all the different communities to uh, network and to get the training they need. And, you know, maybe even uh, some seed and pilot projects and, you know, I, even though it's not directly related to the equity work, I see some of the stuff that uh, CCI is here talking, is going to talk to you about today um, as a great first step towards uh, bringing people into these communities. And so, you know, we have lots of questions in our mind as we think about equity, about how we will define our success and chart our path to it. Um, we're thinking about a lot of metrics that we could use to help us report on diversity of the people that are involved um, and the type of research that's done. And, you know, I'm putting these up as, a, as the basis for a dialogue that we can have during the Q&A. Um, you know, participating is not only about experimental methods, computational methods, it's also about having access to the computational resources to engage. And that's where it's so great that, um, uh, Kathleen and Tim are here, and so I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about ways that actually there have been things set up that may enable uh, researchers uh, within Australia to get engaged at this point. Um, so Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you. You can just tell me when you want me to flip slides. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to do a speed tour of the data coordination platform of the HCA. Um, so we'll go very quickly. Alec, can I see the next slide? So the HCA is profiling millions of human cells across hundreds of individual labs and that generates enormous amounts of data that's been designed to answer very different questions. Researchers are profiling cells for their own research aims and so we have a collection of techniques and data formats that are, are geared to their individual needs and not always to the needs of a greater atlas. Next slide please. The HC community is also diverse and has many different needs and challenges. Our, uh, our community includes researchers in the lab performing experiments and isolating cells, computational biologists identifying how to best approach and analyze sequencing data, software engineers and tool developers trying to create new ways of working with that data, and everything in between. So trying to build a platform that addresses all those different needs, types of data, research aims, and community members is our challenge. Next slide. 
For that, we need a public platform where researchers can interrogate single cell data. The platform needs to be compre comprehensive because there are many data types to describe human cells. It needs to be inclusive. We have people working in labs on different tissues all around the world. It needs to be organized. It needs to be accessible. Within the bounds of consent, access to data should be simple. And above all, it needs to be dynamic. This is a living project that evolves with new data types, new techniques, and new analysis methods emerging all the time. Next slide. Building a meaningful atlas requires us to share and access each other's work. To leverage the breadth of consortia data and knowledge, we must ensure that that data is harmonized and described in a usable way with standardized metadata across all of it. And then we have to bring that data together. Next slide. Standardized processing of raw data in conjunction with collaborator analyses allows us to better leverage our disparate data sets together. The pipelines have to scale to match the size of the consortium's data, and they need to be open to the public for community review and usable by any researcher, not just CHCA. Next slide. After that, we want to make data accessible. Researchers need a way to find it and use it. Data outputs and processing improvements need to be available as, to the community as soon as possible. Data must be regularly released with consistent process data accompanied by research, researcher contributed analysis files. And the data needs to be accessible and discoverable from a central portal so that researchers can find and use it. Next. And beyond that, however, we need scientists need a platform that can integrate with the tools, portals, and software that's most full for usable sorry, most useful for their own research needs. Um, we need an open system that lets users leverage their own institutional infrastructures, software, scripts, and portals, and to use those on consortium data. Next. So that was the aim, and this is how it works. Um, this is the flow of data through the DCP as it exists today. Labs contribute single cell data when they are, when contributors are ready to add their data to the DCP, they work with our data wranglers who conduct a suitability assessment, uh, confirm access and consent, curate it to a high standard of metadata and controlled vocabulary, upload and validate the data and the metadata. At that point, the data becomes publicly accessible if it, to the extent that it is, if it's public data. Um, standard processing is then applied. DCP pipelines are approved by the analysis working group of the HCA. They are cloud native, public, versioned, and documented. They're written in workflow description language and leverage GA4GH standards. They produce alignments, gene matrices, and quality control metrics. Uh, next slide, please. After that, the data moves into the portal. Um, this slide shows the Data Explorer, where multifaceted search supports filtering by HCA metadata and creating cross-project cohorts. Those cohorts with their data, metadata, and expression matrices can be downloaded locally or exported to cloud-based analysis platforms that include Terra, Seven, Brid Seven Bridges, Gen3, Kavatica, and the UCSC cell browser. The data portal also includes links to community portals, third-party tools, and visualization resources, including Cell by Gene, the Single Cell Expression Analysis, and the UCSC cell browser. And any community member can contribute to, to that area, the tools and the portals. Um, next slide. So that was the lightning tour. Um, I think the key questions coming out of this are, are around how best to support you um, and how to work with the communities to determine what compliance is required for different data sets, what are the appropriate ways to manage and give access to them and who does it, and how do we build that understanding and then that system together. Thanks. I'll just conclude really quickly and say thank you for joining us today. I didn't realize it was a holiday uh, for you all, but um, appreciate, appreciate you taking the time and your partnership in advance. Um, if there's anything that I can help you uh, help you to learn about the HCA or um, connect you with individuals so you can figure out how to get involved or just give you a tour of some of the pieces, feel free to reach out to me at any time. It's just my last name at mit.edu. Thanks very, very much, Alex.
Thank you. I'm going to invite um, Norbert and Jonah to provide us with just a, a quick overview of the funding scheme itself, um, just so that we understand what is being um, offered from the Chan Zuckerberg support. And for those of you in the audience, I'd like to encourage you to place questions to the panel in the question and answer box. There will be an, an open um, question and answer session following uh, Norbert and Joan's presentation. Thanks. Hello, everyone. And uh, again, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to give a, just a quick overview of who CZI is and what we're doing in support of the Human Cell Atlas. Um, my name is Norbert Tavares. I'm a program manager for the Single Cell Biology Program, and Jonah Kuhl, uh, the program officer and lead for the program, is also here with us and will be on the panel to answer questions. So CZI. Um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was initially was started by uh, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg um, with the stated goal, as stated there, to uh, help to make the world a better place for their children after the birth of their first child. Um, and so they have devoted, uh, committed to devoting the majority of their wealth within their lifetime to meeting this goal. And so there are three core initiatives, education, justice, and opportunity in science. And I will talk strictly about science today. And the overarching goal is by the end of the century to support the science and technology uh, that will make it possible to cure, prevent, and manage all disease by the end of the century, which sounds a very ambitious goal. But if you think about where we've come within the last 80 years, it should be achievable in 80 years now in the future. And within the short term, we want to accelerate uh, the tools of biomedical science around uh, open um, tools and collaboration models to, to uh, accelerate research. <clears throat> so like many funders, we um, fund uh, grants worldwide, internationally. But we also collaborate and uh, engage with um, other partners within communities, patients, um, to try to uh, do much more than we can on our own and to really uh, accelerate the work and have a differentiated impact across many domains. I think where we are unique from other funders is that we also build open source tools and technologies to help to try to scale and accelerate uh, the research that's being done. And so we have five programs all together right now, imaging, one focused on imaging, one focused on neurodegeneration, one focused on open science, though open science is a theme that runs across all of the programs. Our Science and Society program uh, works with uh, patient-driven uh, organizations as well as um, uh, the public uh, engagement and understanding of science, and then the single cell biology program. So we also build technology and on the right side of the screen, there's a list of some of the tools that we have uh, generated. And if you go to our website, you can read more about these tools. I'll just highlight one, Cell by Gene, which is uh, an open source uh, visualization tool for single cell transcriptomics data. Um, and again, uh, take a look at our website if you'd like to learn more about this particular tool. And so why single cell biology? So we're coming from this from the understanding that if we really want to understand disease, um, we should study it at the fundamental unit of life, which is the single cell. And we believe by focusing on um, helping to build out this technology and these methods, we can help to accelerate science and get a better understanding of disease across uh, humans. So as you know, uh, 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 the Human Cell Atlas is uh, a consortium of scientists that are working on building out this atlas. CZI is one of the main funders, but not the only funder of this program. <clears throat> and so early on, we did some work around um, funding projects to first build out uh, methods and benchmarking and experimental tools, and then also computational tools and small uh, one-year pilot programs. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the outputs of those tools and those teams, again, please visit our website and you can find that information there. 
And then we've also supported um, uh, things like protocols.io where there's a robust community um, specifically around the human cell atlas that has resources and protocols available there. And then <clears throat> our main uh, program right now is around, it's called the C networks. And this is um, a multi-lab um, uh, consortia. There are 38 projects. They're in their second year, three years now. And it's uh, generating the um, initial data that's going to go into the, the DCP to build this initial first draft of the Atlas. Following up on that, we started to look into disease with our inflammation networks. So similarly, these are 29 projects, uh, interdisciplinary teams. Uh, they're just finished their first year now. And the idea here is to get a broad understanding of um, the underlying mechanisms of inflammation, which affects a no wide variety of diseases. So CDI is um, very supportive of and involved in the Human Cell Atlas Equity Working Group. And there's no need to go over that. Uh, Alex already did a good job. Um, but I do want to draw out one particular um, uh, example from that. Uh, so the, uh, the roadshow to Brazil. So the Brazilian, there was a group of Brazilian scientists that helped to organize this meeting um, because of their interest in participating in the Human Cell Atlas. And CZI participated in that. Uh, before that, we had never gotten a single application from Brazil. After this, uh, following the announcement of inflammation, we had a large number of applications from Brazil and we funded our first grantee, uh, which told us something. So we are a, a very young organization. We're in our fifth year now. And a lot of groups simply don't know who we are and that we fund this work. And so part of the reason being here today is to let you know that we exist and to let you know about some of the funding opportunities that are available. So what's next? We've, so we're doing work with the Human Cell Atlas and inflammation. Um, one of the things we're trying to do now is fill in some of those gaps in the human cell atlas. And so pediatrics is one area we've noticed as a gap, and we've just closed an RFA around um, funding pediatrics tissue. And ancestry is another area that we've noticed that there is a growing gap that we want to start to fill. And so we have currently opened an RFA specifically around um, contributing healthy samples to the HCA from understudied and underrepresented atlases, and so are from understudied uh, ancestries. So these are three-year projects. Um, the teams, um, all of our projects that we fund uh, involve interdis interdisciplinary collaborative teams. So you have to have a computational biologist simply because that's the nature of single cell data, experts in single cell biology, and also um, for this RFA, we have um, a requirement for a community engaged researcher. And the reasons there are exactly the reasons that Azure has pointed out, is that we want to be able to um, engage communities in a culturally um, appropriate way um, and be able to continue to have these communities participating in the Human Cell Atlas and other research projects going forward. So uh, the HCA has put together a registry and um, you can go to their website and find that there to be able to help teams come together. Um, and I'll post the link in the chat as well for the funding opportunity if you'd like to read more about that. And if you've got questions regarding this particular RFA and eligibility about this RFA, you can email our uh, science grants at chanzuckerberg.com. And I would strongly encourage everybody to sign up for our um, our listserv to find out about future opportunities. And I'll also drop this in the chat. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing and take questions or back to you, Christine. Thank you very much, uh, Norbert, uh, Alex, um, Kathleen, and Azir for um, sharing the background to the project and I guess the perspective from Australia. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open questions back to you in the audience and um, I, I've also 
uh, would like you to join me in welcoming Alex Brown to the um, panel. Alex is a leader in Australian uh, Aboriginal Health Equity and a member of the uh, South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. So uh, I can see some questions coming through on the, on the chat and I'll um, continue to encourage you to pose those. But I'd first like to open the discussion back to Alex and Azure and just ask whether there are points that you would like to um, bring back to the HCA group or to the funders. I think we give Alex a chance to have his say, if that's okay. Thanks. I'm assuming it's Alex Brown and not the other Alex. Um, so I'll just jump in, Alex, seeing you did such a good job of talking before. Uh, thanks I'd be delighted to jump in, but I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, look, thank you for that that, that background information. Um, I, I think the, the first thing to mention really is that within the Australian context, I'm not aware of any single cell analyses that have played out that involve Indigenous uh, communities or participants. There may have been some that have been included in other research projects where ethnicity or ancestry has not been documented, uh, but clearly we're at the beginning of a journey. Uh, rather than in any substantive space uh, that could, you know, lead to the, the pr production of data of relevance to, you know, HCA's interest. I think uh, the other thing worth noting is really that, that there are many concerns in communities about blood tests, let alone single cell analyses, and we're still working through a whole raft of issues around how do we include Indigenous people and the appropriate protections of their interests in genomics more broadly uh, before we even get down to uh, the, the minutiae of, of, of single cell analyses. Um, I think there's a, a range of questions that have played out. I, I think your holistic agenda, Alex, that you touched on is really all the right words. And I think they're a really good framework for thinking. Um, the question is, how do you operationalise those matters in a substantive way uh, that cover the interests of Indigenous peoples uh, and our diversity, which is uh, another point to consider is that, you know, you get two Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in a room and you'll get three opinions. I know you've probably all heard that sort of cheesy expression before, but diversity is our reality rather than any homogenous indigenous reality in Australia. And, and there will always be very differing views across the board, which needs to be considered. The question that we have is really, what, is, what does sovereignty look like in this context? Uh, and by that, we mean not just managing data, which as a scientist and as a, a person who loves data, very comfortable with the architecture put forward that HCA is progressing. I've got no issues with whether or not science needs us to do this. I, I, that's not the question in my mind. The question is how do we, when rubber hits the road, how do we make sure that we protect, protect the interests of the most marginalised and the people who have been, forgive the expression, bastardised through modern scientific development, which would be the, the communities that we are from and the communities that we work with exclusively. I think we need to think through what's required to deliver this holistic agenda that includes Indigenous people, not just their samples and their data, but includes them in roles of governance and appropriate decision-making uh, in capacity development, in workforce diversification, and in terms of how we interpret data that doesn't heap harm on top of harm for marginalised communities. And these are big questions, many of which we don't have all of the answers for. And therefore, you know, the timing of this initiative uh, may be a little bit premature because many of these conversations are yet to be had in Indigenous communities. So that's the big challenge. The other bit is to think through openly and with a structural response what do Indigenous people offer the world beyond samples that then represent 
an inclusive data uh, capture? And that's a much bigger question. If we're going to break human existence up to it into our tiniest pieces, who's going to recapitulate the whole? We often talk about this. Indigenous people think about holism very, very deeply. If we can work out what drives every cell, how are we going to reconstruct that in the context of disadvantage, um, social marginalisation, oppression and racism? And you might say, well, this doesn't have a lot to do with us capturing single cell analyses from across a broad range of human tissues and human existence. But for us, it means sort of everything. And we're starting to get to a point in Indigenous genomics interests where we're trying to put forward a very clear set of guidance for people who are interested in supporting the interests of Indigenous peoples. And we don't view this as, I certainly don't view this as anything but that. Um, people need to accept we have an agenda here. We need support to prosecute our aspirations. We need to have people collaborate with us on our terms. Um, we need to proceed at our pace, which might be a little slower than everyone's hoping. Uh, it needs to be aligned to our principles and we have to have direct and meaningful benefit, clearly articulated so that we can have a conversation with communities to potentially progress this important scientific and global agenda. Um, that's the terms that we're at. Uh, in terms of Indigenous genomics more broadly. And I think this, the single cell analysis space is right there behind it. And the inclusion in, in really important initiatives like the, the Human Cell Atlas have, um, you know, lots of paths to cut through the jungle before we're probably in a position to, to engage in a story about what equity really looks like on the ground beyond, hey, let's put some tissues uh, into a global uh, data capture system. So I'm trying to be supportive. I'm trying to be forward thinking. I think to get there, there's lots of roads uh, that we need to work through. There's lots of issues to work through. I'll leave it there, Christy. Alex, thank you so much for that um, perspective. And there are a lot of topics um, covered there that I think need to be addressed by the panel. I'm not sure that we have any answers at all? And given that you've been thinking about this for a long time, um, it may be that, that the answer is um, that we develop those procedures and processes in partnership and there is no other way of, of moving forward. Um, but I will uh, open the floor back up to, to Alex, um, Timothy, Norbert and Jonah, Kathleen, if you've got any comments that you wanted to make in response to Alex. I can jump in really quickly and just say that I fully agree with everything that Alex said. And, you know, one of my biggest concerns in this is that um, because of the difficulty, somebody would say, let's not even try. And I think that, that mm -hmm. creates further separation um, between people who have benefited from these advances in science and technology um, and those who have been uh, marginalized in the process. And so um, this is hard. I'm not going to tell you it's not, and I'm not going to tell you I have the answers. Um, I'm committed to working with people as are everybody on the equity working group. And I think everybody I've spoken to in the HCA to help figure out how to do this in a way that's um, respectful and supportive. And, you know, does this through partnership um, rather through, than through transaction. In terms of the, what does data sovereignty look like and what are the processes to manage that? Um, Tim and Kathleen, can I uh, ask you to perhaps comment on your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I would just echo the idea that this is something that we have to, to build together and understand together. I, I think this is, it's important to work with the communities and understand that question. I, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that, nor would it be appropriate for me to. But in understanding it and understanding what the community's needs are and how they would want to manage their data, uh, if that's if that's what's needed, you know, solutions can be made. Um, but it's it's important to start with, you know, what are the needs of the community and and what's appropriate, uh, and then we can build things based off that. <laughs> um, 
I just want to add one thing to what, what Tim said. We, uh, I'll just say at least for me, um, I haven't had these conversations with this community yet, and I would, I would be very remiss to make suggestions without really hearing um, all of all of the concerns and all of the things that um, that are important and critical to do this right. Um, but you know, as I said, this is more of a goal towards partnership than um, than anything else. And, and maybe just to, to chime in very briefly, I again um, appreciate Alex's Alex Brown's comments and kind of referring back and thinking about the, I think, very nice introduction that Azure made, the, the critical role that in, the community engagement and the experts in this field play. Um, you know, I think bringing those experts into these projects, resourcing them appropriately, and giving them a seat at the table, right? And like really making that central is something where, speaking for myself, I, I also do not know these answers, um, but you know, learning from and kind of including those individuals and empowering is I think one area that we're certainly looking to, to do. Um, as, as Norbert touched upon, this is a critical part of those calls. It's something that we appreciate as being important and hopefully will you know, help um, you know, everyone learn and proceed and, and do so in, in the appropriate way. Alex, I um, just wanted to add one last thing, and that is that I am really excited about the philosophy that you put forward on understanding the whole and this holistic approach to um, not just what is cell, uh, but what, what comprises phenotype and what comprises um, that uh, phenotypic experience of being uh, a human within a, a context like the human cell atlas. And um, I am excited about the opportunity of partnering not just around the, um, the processes of community engagement and sample engagement, but about around those um, philosophical ideas as well. That's what gets me in the game. It's like, so let's Same hope too. we can do more of that, have more of that conversation. Jonah and Norbert, um, you gave us a really great overview of the vision of the um, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And I just wondered, in terms of this particular funding call, do you see that there is room to be building infrastructure for engagement or infrastructure around data management um, ahead of data collection per se, are there, are there frameworks, enabling frameworks that might be funded through this initiative? Have you, how prescriptive is the call? I guess is what I'm asking. You wanna go ahead, Robert? You wanna touch on this one? Sure, so this, so we're learning. Every RFA we do is a new RFA. And so this, this call and the previous call around pediatrics was the first time that we had included a community engagement component. Um, and so these two calls really are about um, contributing data to the human cell atlas. But these are the first steps within our learning process. And so we're going to learn something from this about what does and doesn't work and what we should and shouldn't do going forward. And so the next call after that, we'll build on that and go forward from there. Um, and one of the things that we're doing is having lots of conversations with folks that do community engagement and do it well to learn more about what's missing and what we should be doing and how to, to support this work going forward. Um, so that that still early stages right now. That's what I would say. Thanks very much, Norbert. And I guess if people have got questions about specific eligibility questions, they can direct that to the links that you shared in the chat. Christine, could I just make one quick point that um, you know, lots of us on this call have multiple hats on as researchers, first and foremost me with a single cell hat on, me with a human cell atlas hat on. And in the end, the projects, uh, as is your highlighted right at the beginning, should be led by uh, our, our Indigenous researchers. And we're going to be here to help. And the human cell atlas is us. So we dictate 
what we think is important. And the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative are fantastic partners in building the Human Cell Atlas. Um, but we can set our own agenda. And if that fits with the funding call, that's fantastic. And if not, there are other opportunities that we can think about and explore in the future. We don't have to just be restricted to this, but this is a great opportunity for everyone to actually be on this call now and, and have those discussions. Um, so just to highlight that point. Absolutely, thank you very much, Shelley, that's important. I can see a question has come through from uh, Jess Ma. Uh, question to Azuri. What kinds of uh, questions from genomics data are of interest to Indigenous people? Are there applications of this data that would provide more benefits from a medical, societal, or equitable perspective? Yeah, thanks, Christine. So I'm going to have to duck off very, very soon to go into another meeting. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll just quickly answer. I think. Um, I think when I do consent, there are two main reasons that people provide consent um, to be a part of our repository that we're trying to create. Uh, the first being is that, you know, Aboriginal communities are poor. We don't have lots of money coming out of our communities. There's no inheritance, there's no houses or cars or anything like that to leave kids. Um, and so people see their samples as their legacy, something that they're able to leave their children as a way of being able to have better understanding of, um, you know, illnesses and diseases, um, trying to work out why some medication works well for some people and doesn't for others. Um, the second reason is that people are really sick and tired of going to funerals of friends and family that are dying from preventable illnesses and diseases. So I think, um, uh, you know, I mean, it might sound silly, but the, the main reason why people are signing up to these things is because they want that understanding about why they're getting so sick. They don't, you know, they want better medications coming into their communities. They're tired of burying people dying well, but, but, for their age um, so oh sorry I've got my computers going nuts telling me to move um, so for me I think that's what people are interested in first up is around that medical and um, medication and, and medical research um, that's probably how I'd answer that sorry I, I do have to go sorry Christine thanks so much for your time today thank you Christine. thanks guys we are yeah. At the hour, I can see a few more questions coming through. Um, I'm aware that panellists are being brought together from across the globe and probably have got other um, activities that they need to. So I will say a very quick thank you to those who need to leave now and for those who are able to stay on to answer um, a, a few more questions. I, I'll just um, also uh, provide some appreciation I can see that Irene um, has asked uh, a question about um, uh, how, well, the first question she asked, which is to dismiss, was just to understand better what the evaluation process for the, the funding call will be. And um, she's then asked a follow-up question around how the funding call is aligned with the HCA equity activities. So, Jonah, I'm wondering if you could tell us. Sure. About yeah, I can. I can try to take um, first pass of this, and then uh, Alex and Chalin may be able to comment more. So, um, first of the alignment. So, I, as Norbert mentioned, there is participation with the equity working group that CCA sits on, but the call wasn't developed with, or you know, I think it's very much informed and inspired by some of the challenges and similar goals. But I think as Shalin mentioned. Um, you know, the community is distinct and self-governed and, and that is, that's not our responsibility is to support the work that the community is doing. Um, and so hopefully it will support uh, that work and kind of further and move the ball on some of the efforts within the, the equity working group and maybe even raise some new ones and, and continue to help us learn and move forward. On the review question, it's a great question. The way that our review process works, um, I think is quite similar to many other granting organizations, which is that we use external experts, panels of experts. Uh, one thing to be clear about is that anyone that is applying to the call is automatically conflicted out of reviewing for the call. Um, and so similar to NIH and other organizations, we very much rely on 
um, experts and community input and the community to, to help advise us and determine which of, of the proposals that are submitted are ultimately the ones that are selected. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, Chairman Lee, I can see a final question from Al Forrest, um, which has been one that's been um, discussed pretty extensively behind the scenes um, within the Human Group Atlas Equity Working Group. And that is simply um, how, um, how will the data be protected uh, such that, or how may the data be used uh, to align even benign um, racial profiling such as group X have more neurons, therefore smarter, or group Y has more skeletal muscle, therefore they run faster. I guess the question that Al is asking is, if you are including diverse populations within an atlas, how will the findings be summarised and reported and how do we as a community prevent these kind of pseudoscience headlines or um, societal misuse? I'm going to hand that one, I guess, over to, to um, Kathleen, Charlene, Alex. It's, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, it's a great question now. It doesn't have a, a simple answer. I think the first thing to recognize is that each of us is made up of 10 to the 14 cells. And so we are going to be talking about sampling a very small subset where things like exactly where in a muscle somebody took a sample from could contribute to differences as could some of the technologies that are run. So, I mean, we, we know as scientists that there isn't really a, a way of making those sorts of comparisons, but what you're asking more is once data is shared, how do you prevent people from using data in those fashions? Um, and I don't have a great answer. I think that part of it comes down to the way in which you list some of the metadata um, and uh, some of the, the descriptions and things that you put out along with the data to help uh, people understand what, what sorts of analyses can cannot be done um, and, what, um, and what some of the things are powered to do. Um, I, I think that you know, these conversations are critical because it starts to us, it starts to help us think about in what ways the data needs to be anonymized to enable some of the major scientific benefits to be provided back to the communities, but to make sure that there isn't misuse of that data in a way that would create greater harm. Um, and you know, in some places, it may make sense to generate data, but to hold data um, privately as opposed to making it public for a number of different reasons or to not include specific metadata. Um, I will say that in some studies that we have done, for example, around COVID, um, you know, we have specifically gone out of our way to comment, that, you know, that we're not powered in certain analyses um, that may have to do with, you know, ethnic background, um, and to, you know, try and um, and to try and not emphasize some of those variables um, and and highlight some of these pieces. But it is a real concern and something that needs to um, be thought of broadly. And I just wouldn't claim to have enough experience to um, to give you a holistic answer. But if we can think of all the ways in which it may be misused, I think we can begin to think about ways in which we could prevent that from happening. Thanks very much, Alex. I mean, I think um, this highlights to me the importance of um, consideration of data sovereignty within communities and partnership on how data is shared um, back Back to a broader community. We're now well and truly past the, the 60 minute mark and while I can see still very many questions coming through, I think it's time that we do draw this panel to a close. And I would like very much to thank all of the panellist members, in particular um, uh, Jonah and um, Norbert from Chan Zuckerberg, thank you for coming along. Uh, Alex, Kathleen and Tim and of course, Charlene from Human Cell Atlas. And a special thank you to Azia and Alex Brown for coming and providing such a, a strong and meaningful representation from um, the um, Australian Indigenous research communities here in, in Australia. Just like to, to finish by saying that Oz Single Cell is an active network um, specifically around 
uh, engagement on the technology platforms and education on the technology platforms here in Australia. It's a great network of individuals who are really happy to engage and enable um, projects that are led from Australian Indigenous communities. And please contact me if you would like more details on, on how we can make that happen. Thank you very much all for your time today. Thank you very much for putting this together, Christine. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for having us.